So you've just hit plan for the King 2 and how do I play? What do these numbers mean? Who's in my house? Hello? What's up everyone, this is Genuine. We're going to be taking a look at all 12 classes in For the King 2, what their roles are, their primary stats, skills, and also I'm going to be giving you a ranking based on early impressions. The game is still fresh, and of course there's always the chance that we'll see some nerfs and buffs and balances just to make the classes play better. If you want to see how to unlock all these classes without farming lore, so that way you can use them in your next run, this is great, especially if you're a veteran For the King player, so that way you and your friends can get in and play exactly the roles you want and experience the new classes, instead of just rehashing the same old, same old. Let's start with an absolute classic, the Blacksmith. Not only is the Blacksmith the tank for the For the King franchise, but they're also an excellent damage dealer, with strength and vitality weapons being some of the highest single target damage weapons in the entire game. Their primary stats are vitality, strength, and surprisingly talent, which means that they're actually pretty good navigators when it comes to sailing. They have an incredibly strong passive ability that works perfect with their class. Steadfast has the ability to fully negate any incoming attack. That includes status ailments, curses, magic, or just plain old physical damage, which makes them even that much better to protect your soft and squishy damage dealers. They start with a very strong starting weapon and a simple shield, which means as soon as you start a run, the blacksmith is likely going to be your highest damage and most tankiest character right off the bat. Next up, we have the wizard of the group. Every good party needs a wizard. The scholar is going to be an easy pick for a magic AoE damage dealer. They're basically as squishy as they come, so if you can, try to position them behind somebody who has a shield. Again, this is a class that starts with a 78 skill, which means that they have a very high probability to guarantee some kind of damage every turn. And if you have any kind of skill check on the map, a 78 base stat is basically as good as you can hope for. Now, the Scholar has seen some improvements since the first game with two passive abilities instead of one. We have Refocus, which gives you a chance to restore focus at the end of your turn. And they have Find Scroll, which gives you a chance to find a random scroll at the end of your turn on land or in a dungeon. Next up, we have a pretty interesting class that has a lot of versatility and flexibility, the Herbalist. When you hear Herbalist, you're going to be thinking utility, support, and that's it. But if we actually take a quick glance at the stats, you'll see the primary stats are Intellect, Awareness, and Talent. And they boast a high 76 Intellect and Awareness, which means that they can dish out pretty consistent magic or physical damage. And with 58 Vitality, they're going to be a little less squishy than their Scholar counterparts. Their two special abilities are Find Herb, which gives you a random chance to find an herb when you end your turn on land or in a dungeon, and Party Heal, which in For the King 2 has a lot more functionality than For the King 1. So first off, it only uses a secondary action. You're no longer going to be sacrificing an attack in order to Party Heal, which makes it unbelievably more viable in For the King 2 than it was in the first game. And what's more, it heals you for the full effect of the herb, and adjacent party members for half the healing. Which means that you want to invest in upgrading the herbalist pipe as soon as possible so that way they can be as effective as possible with their party heals. A super important thing to note is that the party heal does work in the overworld. So while traveling on the map you can group up your buddies, pop a god's beard, and you'll be happy to know that everyone will share in the healing. They start with a walking stick which is again a pretty mid-tier weapon but because they have the high intellect and awareness it gives them a lot more options in acquiring new weapons especially early on in the game. Next up, we have another starter class, the Stable Hand. With 78 speed and 74 strength, it's easy to see how this is an obvious choice for a high evasion melee fighter. The Stable Hand has low vitality, however, which means if you fail the dodge, you're going to be punished extremely hard, especially early game. At the end of the day, the Stable Hand and Hunter do fill similar roles, being high single target damage and high evasion. Where they really stand apart is the special abilities. So the Stable Hand has Hard Work, which gives them another primary action whenever they spend their last focus. At a glance, this sounds amazing, but when we consider how seldom that we're actually regaining focus, it doesn't proc very often. And because of how this ability procs when you spend your last focus, that means you're always going to want to maintain either 1 or 0 focus, which doesn't put you in a good position to disarm traps, do skill events in the overworld, or guarantee a big hit. They start with a Wooden Sword, which is a good starting weapon, and it's a one hand, so as soon as you find a shield, it's an obvious first choice to give it to the stable hand. Finally, we have another classic RPG class, the Hunter. With 78 awareness, 74 speed, and 60 talent slash strength, 
you can see how already this class fills a similar role to the stable hand. Now where the hunter comes ahead in leaps and bounds is the special abilities. They are the only class so far that has four special abilities. That is insane off the bat, but let's take a look at them. So first off, they have Elite Sneak, which gives them an advantage when sneaking past enemies. They only have to roll two slots when sneaking past solo enemies or three for camps. After that, we have Elite Ambush, which is the similar vein, but this requires only one slot to ambush a solo enemy or two slots for camps, which means with their already incredibly high awareness, if you just take a couple of awareness items, you're basically be guaranteed to ambush enemies, which is a huge bonus to any team. After that, they have Called Shot, which gives them a random chance to perfect an attack with a bow, which gives you a big incentive to take a bow with a heavy attack and just roll the dice on that every single time. And finally, we have Energy Boost, which gives you a small chance to gain one movement on the overworld. The way it's phrased, however, would make you think that it has the potential to give you another primary or secondary action at the end of a combat turn. However, I have never seen that proc, and I don't believe that's its actual function. I think the text should probably be changed a little bit to clarify a little bit better. But as far as we know right now, it just has a random chance to give you an extra movement at the end of your turn on the overworld. With the starter classes out of the way, let's talk about the first class that you're probably going to unlock while you're playing the game, the Alchemist. So the Alchemist has 76 Intellect, 76 Speed, and 76 Talent, which means that they obviously fill the role of a Mage, but with their higher movement speed, they play a little bit better with taking Evasion instead of just taking full Resistance Armor. They do have two special abilities, the first one is a little lackluster, and the second one can be big depending on how often it procs. So first off, we have Smoke Flea. It gives you the ability to flee from any combat tile, and you only have to roll one dice, which is pretty big if shit hits the fan, but for most adventures, you're probably going to want to be staying kind of grouped with your party, and you don't want to be leaving anybody out to hang. So having a more powerful flea is not that big, because you're probably only going to be wanting to use it maybe a half a dozen times at most in a game. Make Potion, however, is pretty good, and again, it kind of just depends on RNG at the end of the day at how often you're getting this to proc. I personally think that the Herbalist kind of fills a similar role, and the Find Herb combined with the passive Party Heal is just ultimately better, but maybe you'll find a place for the Alchemist in your party. Next up, we have the Shepherd. With 76 Awareness, 76 Vitality, and 70 Intellect, they are an incredibly unique and versatile class. They have the ability to take either an Awareness weapon or a Vitality weapon and tank with a shield, or they can even use spell tomes or staffs almost as good as an alchemist or a herbalist. Along with their reasonably high health, they also have the passive ability Herd. Herd gives you a chance to randomly find a sheep at the end of your turn while traveling on the overworld. What does the sheep do? As far as I can tell, it's just there to have its adorable face cleaved in half with an axe. Yeah, you heard it. I don't think you can sell them. I don't think there's any utility with them besides just tanking an attack. They are similar to the farmer's scarecrow, except for the farmer's scarecrow is temporarily has a random chance to proc, and you can't bring it along with you into multiple fights. The shepherd does start with the shepherd's crook, which is just a pull arm that has the ability to push. You're probably going to want to equip them with the bow or a one-hander and a shield depending on how you want to play the class as soon as you find them. Next up we have another returning class from the first game, the Woodcutter. The Woodcutter's got 78 strength, 74 awareness, and 66 speed, which again makes them another candidate for a melee fighter with high evasion, or with their high awareness you could potentially even throw a bow on them, but taking anything besides a two-handed melee weapon will give you a large penalty because of their special ability, Justice, which gives them a chance of adding splash damage to a perfect strike with two-handed weapon. With Justice being the only special ability for the Woodcutter, it essentially locks your class into one specific weapon type, which is extremely unfortunate, and because of that lack of versatility, you'll probably have a hard time choosing the woodcutter over more tanky melee options but maybe you'll find a place for the woodcutter in your team they do start with a very strong starter weapon however the wood axe which lets them delete early enemy really fast meaning you don't have to spend as much god's beard or in from taking damage so there is a bit more of an incentive to grab the woodcutter next up we have the pathfinder with 76 awareness 70 talent and 70 speed you're going to find the pathfinder fills a similar role as the hunter but with a lot less solo ability they don't have elite ambush or elite sneak which means that they can't get around the map and attack enemies single as easily as the hunter but they do have a lot of utility with their two abilities scout and survey scout gives you a chance to reveal the contents of the next dungeon room which does have some utility but i challenge you this you can't leave a dungeon so you're gonna go to that next room and you're probably gonna want to stay topped up on your health the entire time you're in a dungeon so does it entirely matter no but it does let you cater your build specifically to the enemies in the next room especially late game 
where you might have a full build for shock resistance, or you might have a full build for flame resistance or magic damage. So it does have utility, granted, but its usefulness is kind of far and few between compared to some of the other special abilities that we've already looked at. Now what I think is the stronger of the two abilities, Survey, it gives you a chance to discover hidden overworld points of interest, which means anything on the overworld that is generated with the map seed, alluring pools, dungeons, catacombs, points of interest, towns, sanctums, you name it. Survey is very useful, however if you play your cards right and are just deleting enemies you're going to have more than enough gold to buy some vision scrolls and if you have a little bit more speed like the stable hand does then you're just going to have an easier time getting around the map and actually getting to those points of interest. For those two reasons I actually don't think survey is that great. Yes, it does save you some time, but for the most part, you're going to want to explore 90 to 100% of the map by the end of the game anyways. So it just kind of helps you get to points of interest faster and with less guesses. But at the end of the day, it doesn't have that much utility. They do start with a good weapon, however, the Crack Bang, which is just a mid-tier boomerang. But it does have the ability to target all enemies in one row, which with this item, you can very easily demolish swarms of enemies. However, a lot of classes do have splash attack damage, which means that they're going to be hitting three enemies for potentially more damage. So all in all, the Pathfinder is okay, I just feel like there's other classes that kind of do the same thing as Pathfinder, but with slightly to much better abilities. Let me introduce the Farmer. With 74 Awareness, 74 Strength, and 74 Vitality, they're primarily going to be fulfilling the role of a high durability damage dealer. Now I do say damage dealer and not tank specifically because of their special ability. Their special ability is Build Scarecrow, which gives them a chance to randomly build a Scarecrow on any available front row combat tile. And I do want to emphasize front row, because it provides protection behind it like a tank would with the shield. The Scarecrow has 5 hit points and takes 1 damage every turn that it's on the field, and every time it gets attacked. So it could potentially tank 5 attacks, which you're most likely going to get 3 or so good uses out of it before it expires. And I do want to emphasize the Scarecrow does protect whoever's behind it, which means it's excellent to use in a party with some squishy damage dealers like the Scholar or the Hunter. They can stand behind their own Scarecrow and not worry about taking damage. This makes them a pretty decent class combined with their high awareness to do some solo ambushes and get out of it without taking much damage. They do start with a decent melee weapon, the Pitchfork, which is just a high damage pull arm. Next up, we have the good old Friar. The Friar has 76 Intellect, 76 Fatality, and 68 Strength, which means that they're going to fill the role of a magic dealing tank or just a really durable mage. Now, they have some hilarious passive abilities. They have Cheers, a chance to pass on the effects from an alcoholic beverage to neighbors in combat, which means when you throw back some alcohol, you'll have a chance to give the buff and debuff to your allies. Now, I do want to emphasize the debuff because as the Friar, you might forget that you don't take any debuffs from alcohol, but your allies do. With the next special ability, Iron Belly, you negate all negative debuffs from alcohol, which means you can throw back whatever you want as often as you want. This is a very powerful special ability, as long as you make accommodations to make sure the Friar is always topped off. With Iron Belly and Cheers, that means one person on the team is at least going to be sober and have the full benefit of the alcohol that you use, especially if it's a damage negating buff. You could potentially save the entire team in a dicey fight when Cheers procs. Lastly, they have the best special ability to couple the other two, Find Alcohol. So similar to Find Potion or Find Herb or Find Scroll, you have a random chance to find it while traveling on the overworld, which just makes their class that much more viable that you don't have to spend your precious gold on getting alcohol. They do start with a very strong intellect based mace and an intellect based shield, which is pretty unusual, which gives them the skill guard and a little bit of resistance. Lastly, and one of the absolute worst classes in the game, it's a bit of a meme, the Hobo. The Hobo has 70 stat points across the board, besides Luck, which only has 50. Now, in For the King 1, you might have found a lot of utility with the Hobo, and you would be incorrect to assume that they have the same utility in For the King 2. Reason being is because you have four party members, it is a lot easier to get a well-balanced spread of skills across the board to basically guarantee you have someone who is best at doing every kind of skill check on the map. Let's paint a scenario though, let's say your buddies tripled down on a class and took 3 blacksmiths, and you're considering taking the hobo so that way you have a perfect spread across the board and you're going to have an easy time doing skill checks on the map. Unless you're taking straight mage armor that gives you a lot of extra focus points and popping golden roots left and right, you're going to be worse off than a scholar would be at doing those skill checks. A scholar gets refocus and already covers a lot of the basis that a blacksmith doesn't, which means that which means the scholar is going to be more capable of just focusing down skill checks, and providing the team with a high variety of high stat points, which is going to make them more likely to succeed at unfocusable skill checks. Combine that with the fact that the Hobo has no special abilities, they really don't have a place in For the King 2. 
Yes, in For the King 1, choosing the hobo was not the worst choice. There's only three team members, which means it's a lot harder to cover all your bases with just your three team members. But in For the King 2, even if someone doubles up on a class or doubles up on a similar role, it is very difficult to not have a good spread of stat points. And with no special ability, in the long run, the hobo is only going to suffer. I threw together a quick tier list. This is based on early impressions and keep in mind that classes may be buffed and nerfed with patches and hotfixes in the future. Keep that in mind, this is mainly for beginners to just see maybe what a good team comp could be at a glance. Let me talk about some notable classes real fast. So the blacksmith, if you want a tank in your group, the blacksmith is the tank of For the King. As often as steadfast procs, it gives you the ability to fully negate any attack, which makes you so much more survivable, it means you're consuming a lot less God's beard, and puts your allies behind you in a much safer position as long as you've got your shield equipped. The Hunter is easily the best class for solo content, especially if you build them full evasion. They're going to be very hard to hit, do high consistent damage, and their ability to elite ambush helps your team snowball and stay so far ahead of the curb if you play your cards right. Instead of having to take on four enemies at a time, the Hunter with their speed and elite ambush has the potential to pull each enemy individual, granting the same amount of rewards, and basically guaranteeing your team doesn't take any damage. If you position a hunter right, the elite ambush is a huge, huge ability. Before we go, I just want to touch on aids here. The farmer is a good all-around class that has... A, the farmer is a good all-around melee class, and the scarecrow helps you squish your allies. Potentially, the prior could be excellent, and they could out-tank the, the blacksmith, but it's based on RNG, or you're going to have to be pouring money into him, which money could be spent on gear upgrades, the Scholar is a notable class in A. Honestly, I think for most runs, the Friar is an easy pick over the Scholar. That being said, the fact that they refocus means that they can pass a lot of skill checks easily if they're staying topped off on their focus. And it also means that they can basically guarantee some killing blows, which will deny an enemy an attack. Depending on your team composition, the Herbalist could be necessary or not necessary. And depending on RNG, you could see huge benefits from them or not. So the Herbalist relies on find herb and party heal. The party heal is huge. It means that you don't have to sacrifice any damage dealing capabilities with another intellect user to have a party heal staff. The herbalist is really just a really powerful early class just based on their utility and their support abilities. But late game especially, they kind of fall off and you might want to choose another class over the herbalist even early game so that way you can get ahead of the curve and stay ahead of the curve. Comment below with your S tier classes to help people out or shit on my picks. It's up to you, but that's going to be it for this video. If you liked it, make sure to subscribe and hey, listen up. I'm going to be posting a video on how to unlock all the classes this afternoon. So make sure to subscribe so that way you get the notification when that video goes live. It'll just help you and your friends get into the thick of it a lot faster, especially if you played For the King 1 to death. You don't really want to just be replaying the same classes over and over again. So if you want to see how to unlock those without having to grind or wait for the RNG to see if the events pop up on your specific game seed, then click over to that video. Thanks guys.